Welcome to Thinking Edge with Ed Boudreau. So we couldn't be more excited to be with Jennifer Laban today. She is the Chief Talent and Diversity Officer at Mentor Click. So thank you so much for being with us today. Yeah, thank you for having me. I'm really excited to talk about this topic. Absolutely. And you're an author, multiple time author in one of your books is Mentoring Programs That Work, which, which I read, which I found incredible. Oh, thank you so much. Mentoring is something that a lot of people have to include in their roles and not everyone has the skills and the experience to do it. So that's where the book came from. That's awesome. What do you, what do you think the keys to a great mentoring program are? Because I think we all have this concept of mentoring, some good and probably not, not some good. What do you think makes a, a great mentoring program actually work? I think remembering that mentoring programs are made up of lots of individual mentoring relationships, which means that there are so many experiences going on on an ongoing basis. It's not about launching a mentoring program with a big splash. It's not about a graduation ceremony. It's about all the learning that happens in between. Right. So it's experiential based. What do you think really some of the best mentoring programs that you've seen, what do you think creates that great experience? I think that there's a lot to leverage in terms of making sure that participants understand their roles. So mentor roles and mentee roles, or of course we can call them all sorts of things, protégés and sponsors and coaches and coaches and, and things like that. But understanding that there's mentoring partners, there are people who are in there and they want clarity, they want tools and they want some structure to know what they should be doing, what's in bounds and what's out of bounds and understand what their roles are really. That's incredible. What do you think about, and I love the idea around clarity, and I guess as a, if we take the, the role of a, a mentor and you're looking to really enable someone, and the way I've seen mentoring is folks that are early in their career, perhaps folks that are you know, mid-career and then folks that are you know, later in their career. How do you think of that spectrum perhaps or, or something that you may have? And and how to bring clarity in each one of those, those cases to say, as a great mentor, I can ask the following questions, perhaps that gains, gains clarity for both. Yeah, I think that, first of all, I think that there's like these, some myths that are out there that we mm. are, we have to continue to combat as far as a traditional perspective on mentoring. So mentoring is not just for either new employees, junior employees, or executive coaches, and you know that's kind of it. It's not something that should be exclusively for those who are anointed for succession plans, but mentoring is powerful at any stage of career. It's powerful for personal growth as well. And so I think that the, the first and most important insight is to understand that no matter where you are in your career, no matter where your team is, or your, you know the how many people you have in their, your department, there are so many opportunities to learn from others. And these learning relationships are all forms of mentorship. So bringing clarity to that work means figuring out what the purpose of that mentoring relationship is and building tools and structure around that purpose. And you may have a purpose for getting some mentoring relationships in place or a structured program in place to help marginalized groups gain access and increase their networks. Or you might have a purpose where you're trying to help new employees understand the unwritten rules of the culture. All of that is great. They're all super valid. It's a matter of understanding that and then building from there. Yeah. I almost think about that as, you know, under your, your purpose is understanding your why, right? Yes. And what, what you're trying to achieve I think that's that's incredible because it, it, if it starts with that why, then you can actually start to form great relationships on on that basis. And I love your your myth busting idea. What other myth myth busters do you have around mentoring? One of my favorite myths to bust, I guess, is the that same like sort of traditional 
patriarchal view of mentoring where you have a, an older man sharing all sorts of war stories with someone they've hand selected, you know, all of which is captured in that kind of assumption and myth piece. But really, um, my favorite way to think about a mentoring relationship is that it's a story. And contrary to <laughs> a popular belief in, in the story, the hero isn't the mentor, it's the mentee. Mm -hmm. And every story has a great beginning, a middle and an end. And it's the mentee who is driving through those stages, who is experiencing that transformation. And the mentor shows up along the way to give them resources when they need it, to provide connections and contacts and, and maybe even an experience or guidance point or two. I love that. Make the men mentee the hero of the story. And I, I clearly all mentors <laughs> need to have that kind of perspective. I really love that. And then I think even that arc of beginning, middle and end gives a concept to the, the mentor and the mentee, like, hey, like, where do you want to go? How, how can I help you? You know, where are you starting at now? And, and how do we help get you to that, that next place that you want to be? And that's just really talk about clarity and simplicity. That's, that's just beautiful. Yeah. And I, I mean, obviously I didn't come up with the hero's journey. So nods to, to Joseph Campbell for that. But one of my mentors, Nancy Duarte, her work around understanding the contrast between the beginning and the end, understanding the contrast between what is and what could be is what creates momentum for us moving forward. And within a mentoring relationship, that's true as well. So having a mentee sort of live and express and vocalize the difference between where they are and, and the delta to where they want to be, that's essential, I think, to seeing that progress and growth. That's great. How do you think about, you know, because I mentoring is a very specific word, and, and sometimes you'll hear about creating a personal board of directors. How do you kind of contrast or separate or are they combined or how do you think about personal board of directors and, you know, should a mentor be a part of that or, or I'd love your concept around that. Sure. And we're actually addressing another myth that I like to bust, which is the myth of the single mentor. I don't mm. think that cool. that's a fair concept for anyone. Um, if you look at Hollywood, you know, your Mr. Miyagi's and Doc Brown's and uh, Yoda's of the world, then we, we grow up thinking that there is this one person who's going to mm -hmm. drop in and make everything better and fix everything for us. That's not really true. I think, you know, personally, I have a, a parenting mentor uh, mm -hmm. because I have two young kids and I am always trying to figure out how to be a better parent. And my parenting mentor isn't someone who's going to give me advice on my career, but super essential for that and in my life. And so I think the idea of having that personal board of directors, understanding who is out there, who inspires you, motivates you, challenges you, and is ready to give you that feedback that you need in different areas of your life is very important. Yeah, it's a great way to, to think of, about, you know, multiple mentors or, or your board of directors in, in different areas that you're looking to, to grow, understand, potentially achieve. I'd say there's potentially a lot of folks out there who don't know how to get started. Like, I would love a mentor. I just don't know the appropriate way to reach out, whether it's in my company, perhaps, or not. Maybe I'm, you know, seeking a career and I'm, I'm really looking to develop a relationship with someone that could could help me break into a a craft so to speak how would you how would you kind of advise someone to get, get started about creating a you know a mentor relationship or a board of of mentors or, or board of directors well i i think to to use the phrase that you brought up i think you start with why so mm -hmm. you start with what are you trying to achieve and let that help be your your guiding light as far as who you look at and what kind of mentoring relationship are you interested in. So I think that's a first step. And the best mentors out there are going to want to say yes if you approach them with proactivity and intention and clarity, there's the word again, as far as saying, Ed, I think you're, you do incredible work. I want to learn more about that. That's the direction I see my career going. Here's what I'm prepared or what I'm proposing. And you know, your level of effort minimized, hopefully. And when you do that, I think 
people, humans who are super busy, are much more likely to say, yes, let's try it. That sounds great. I think we collectively, people get a little intimidated or they get nervous or anxious. And so it ends up coming out like, um, and I, I don't know, I thought maybe you could mentor me. And then, and then now all of the responsibility is on that potential mentor and they're thinking, how am I going to say yes to this? I don't know what that means. I don't know what, if I can devote that time, there's just too many variables. I don't think I can say yes. So all of that to say, I think there's often a misstep of making sure that you are clear with what you're pitching and, and what you're asking for. And you're going to get a lot more yeses than you think. Yeah, that's, that's great. I know I, I said the word why, but I was thinking of Simon Sinek's, you know, why, how, and the what. That might be a nice framework for folks to think about in terms of, hey, my, my why is, you know, I'd like to progress in my career. My how is I'm engaging with folks that look like they've had some experience in, in that background, in that craft. And the what is, I'd like to meet on a monthly basis or a quarterly basis to get your guidance around my career. And that's a very kind of clear ask, right? Yes. Yeah. That I'd never say no to be like, all right, let's do this. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And if you put that kind of attention in and deliberation in mm. and, and thought, it comes across. And so not only is it easier for your potential mentor to say yes, if they really can't say yes, they are pretty likely to suggest someone else you should talk to, right? Because they they will appreciate that effort. And and you will too. It pays off because once you start those conversations, you know exactly what you're working on. In coming to, to why, wh why did you focus on mentoring and, and perhaps some of your your best mentors? What it what did that look like? So you know either one of those questions, why why is your expertise, why did you settle on, on mentoring and, and what's, the, what's, what's your why, what's your purpose around that? So I started my career building employee development programs around leadership and leadership development. And over the first half of my career, I started to see more and more that bringing people into a boot camp or a training wasn't getting us the results. It wasn't comparable. There was no ROI to that. And sorry to all of my colleagues in, in talent development, but, but, you know, when it's not done perfectly well, you, there's just sort of diminishing returns on that. And then I implemented more and more mentoring programs. And the difference was just 180. Uh, so research by Center for Creative Leadership and so many other institutions has shown that we learn best from experience mm -hmm. and from others. And mentoring combines both of those methodologies. So we do engage in mentoring conversations and we hear new ideas and we get inspired. And maybe we get feedback. That's not where the learning happens though. The learning happens between those conversations. When we go out and we try something and we fail, we make mistakes. And then we come back to that next conversation and we debrief those mistakes and come up with a new way, iterate on how I might do that differently, go out and try it again and maybe this time I succeed. And that process of learning in between the mentoring conversations, that process of iteration and minimum viable product, like all of these ideas are tied together and they come out meaning that the power of mentoring is measurably better than any other tool we have for helping people reach their full potential. So that's why I ended up in mentoring. And it's not just about the research I've done. It's not just about the work I've done, but I've experienced that <laughs> myself in my own career. I have been so gifted to have been invested by mentors. One of my first mentors was Elaine Beek. She is uh, someone who has done, has had lifetime achievements in in the same space and i i saw her speak i approached her i asked her out for coffee she agreed 
and turns out she doesn't even drink coffee. She was just impressed by my courage to <laughs> ask her. And that was almost 20 years ago, I want to say 15 years ago. And it's been an incredible experience. She is my business guru, my Jiminy Cricket on the side of my, you know, my shoulder. And she's just one mentor. I Charlie Gilkey from Productive Flourishing is a thought leader that combines these this background in philosophy and his career in the military with best practices by Simon Sinek and and Seth Godin and all these incredible people so working with someone who makes these connections you know out of thin air has been inspiring and I could probably speak for another hour about the mentors I've had but all of these people have shown me that being vulnerable respectful open and proactive pays off I love that energy that you bring to that. And I think part of the message there is be courageous, shoot high and, you know, shoot for the stars, right. Around, you know, your, your passions and, and you're likely to make that connection to an incredible mentor that, that lasts a lifetime. Yes, for sure. That's incredible. And when you, when you think about, you know, I have this concept in mind around a mentor and I think about the coach in a way that's analyzing and seeing performance and making very specific recommendations, like you should try this path or, you know, you should try this tool and see, you know, see how that works. And that, that might create that learning cycle. The other part of that spectrum I think about is, is a sounding board where I'm just listening and reacting and questioning, you know, how, how do you think about that spectrum as a, as a mentor and is it, is it adaptive? Is it one or the other? You know, what have you found kind of how a mentor should think about that directive coach versus that questioning leader that reflects back and says, what are the resources available to you? You know, that type of thing. So if I can ever find a way to work a cooking analogy into a conversation, I will. So here's my opportunity. I love uh, it. <laughs> So I think that, you know, if you're, if you're making a dish and there's a flavor that you really love and it just, you know, makes something saying, I love lemon and citrus. It just, it does great things for my palate, but when I'm making uh, a dish, if I overdo the lemon juice and I don't put in anything that is uh, maybe creamy or fatty or something to balance out that citrus, it becomes acidic and bitter and it loses it loses its impact and what you talked about about asking great questions or giving advice or things like that these are all ingredients that a mentor can use in any given conversation and what's important is understanding that i don't think there's really bad mentors out there i think there are mentors who overuse their ingredients <laughs> Mm, and yeah. then it becomes challenging and, and not beneficial to do that. So I once worked with a mentor who prided himself on his role plays because he said, you know, that his mentees learned so much from his role plays. He had this approach to role plays that said, you can never succeed in my role plays. They're always impossible to win. <laughs> And that was not the greatest approach. I mean, yeah, maybe some of his mentees would respond well to that, feel challenged and invigorated. But even someone who responds well and resonates with that style isn't going to resonate with that every single time, right? So understanding that you're there to be the mentor to your hero, to your mentee, mm -hmm. and whatever they need, not just as a person and in their preferences, but in that moment, in that conversation, it may be different. Right. Yeah. I love that idea around being a chef and being, being adaptive and, you know, really having different spices or, or tools to reach for and being adaptive in the situation and really understanding what the, the end outcome is and, and leveraging different tools and different ways for different people. Cause it'll have, you know, an impact on the outcome. I love that. Yeah. And I, not everyone is comfortable with all of these different tools, right? I'm not a natural cheerleader, like the go get them kind. It's easier for me to dive into the tactical and tell me what you're, what you're thinking as far as the next steps. And that is more natural for me. But what that means is when you've identified 
what is natural for you, which of those tools you gravitate towards, you need to find opportunities to use the other tools because the time to use them is not when you need them. It's right. before that. And so I look for opportunities in a casual conversation to mm -hmm. be supportive, to celebrate small wins. And the more I do that, the more it can become a more natural action and behavior for me as a, as a mentor. That's awesome. You know, you mentioned a few different tool types. I'd love to know if you have anything, you know, else to add to this. I'm sure you have a million, you know, there's the support tool, there's the energy tool, there's the role play potentially. I've never done that before, but it'd be interesting to try, right? It's not my toolkit. And then, you know, the ability to, to question, I guess, when you think about different tools, is there anything that, that you'd add to that or some important tools that I may have missed in our conversation? Well, one way that I try and frame this up as something that's actionable in your mentoring conversations is we use a framework called ally, advisor, and advocate. Hmm. And the ally role is when you are there to champion an idea, but that often means giving critical feedback. So you see someone who you see your mentee needing a redirect, or you see your mentee hasn't gotten feedback about maybe how they're coming across or language they're using, you are obligated to give that mentee that feedback. That is being their ally. If you think about the best mentor you've ever had, you're not going to say they were nice to you. You're going to say they told you what you needed to hear. And so that ally is about saying what needs to be said. Hopefully there's a lot of positive there, but it also means giving them a feedback. And remember, feedback is a gift, no matter how it's wrapped, right? Yeah, that's awesome. And, and then the advisor is sharing experiences, yes, but that's kind of the last tool in that advisor stack. It should be asking open-ended questions first. And even if you think you know the direction it should go in, it should not be on your agenda. Your mentees will regularly surprise you by their creativity and where they think it should go. And then the advocate is that supportive champion who says, I know you're worried about this, but I've seen you do X, Y, Z before and you did great. By the way, my close colleague that I've worked with for 20 years is doing something similar. Would you like me to introduce you? Right, they use their political mm -hmm. capital to, to help create more connections, more resources for their, for their mentoring partners. What a great, simple, but powerful framework for even you know, mentors and mentees to bring clarity and, and role switching right to, yes. to, to, to the relationship. I, I love the simplicity of those, those three different ways to, to think. Absolutely. I love that it, you, you brought up the mentee. Absolutely. This works for the mentee too. Yeah. I think we need to have common language. Common language gives us permission to be vulnerable and open. And so as a mentor, if I'm thinking, okay, ally, advisor, and advocate, where do I need to be right now in this conversation? If I'm missing the mark, but my mentee understands ally advisor and advocate, right? This isn't Wizard of Oz. There's no curtain here. They understand that they could say, Jen, I, I hear you asking me some good advisor questions, but I don't think that's what I need right now. I think I need an advocate. And it makes that conversation easier. One of the things I think about just kind of as a, a general principle of, of mine is, it's funny, I, I went to this, this conference with early career folks and I looked over the, the crowd and I'm like, wow, just think about the capabilities of mm. of everyone in this room and, and how they could actually change the world and I think about you know even even myself what am I what am I capable of that I'm not seeing that someone else does see in me and that can really kind of excite you know a, a new part of me that I can bring change to the world or to my company or myself how do you think about you know what's what's in people and, and how to how to bring that out that is the, the basis of what I do every day is trying to find a better answer to that. But I think that what we've learned, what we know is that everyone is coming to the table with potential and experience and insights and wisdom that is different and potentially can 
be a, a multiplier for the team, mm. for the mentor. And so starting from a place for every relationship, whether it's going to be categorized as a mentoring relationship or not, but when you, when you meet people starting from a place of curiosity and empathy in that conversation and being open to hearing and listening from them, being open to what they have to say to you, whether you have a C-level title or not, whether you are, have decades of experience or not, I think coming to that relationship and saying, you know, according to our mentoring program, maybe I'm supposed to be the mentor, but I truly believe I'm going to learn from you as well. I think that's, that creates respect, mutual respect. And I think it creates a deeper level of trust, which then enables the learning to happen, which then enables the critical conversations to happen. I like to, to do this quick little self-reflection exercise. So to explain, I mean, we talk about trust. If you ever read anything on mentoring, people are going to talk about trust. It's kind of like the go-to thing. But what annoys me is that usually it's very surface level. It's like, yes, you need, you need to build trust. What does that mean? Right. And why is that so important? I mean, I'm a trustworthy person. What do I, you know, so it should be fine. It should be automatic. Well, really, if I'm working with a mentoring partner, they don't know me. They don't have any reason to trust me with their career, which is what mentoring is. And so to understand the importance of it, I like to ask people to kind of imagine your best friend in the world. The person that if you're having a really bad day at work, which I'm sure no one listening to this would have be having a bad day, but just imagine. <laughs> um, and you cannot wait to call this person and just vent, just unload. And you know that this person is going to hear you exactly how you intend. They're not going to judge you for what you have to say. They're going to tell you what you need to hear. Now that person and that trust that you've built with that person, that didn't take days or weeks or months, more than likely it took years, sometimes many years to get to that level. And what we want is for people in mentoring relationships to open up to that level. And yet they only have months to have that relationship get results. So they don't have the luxury of building that trust over time. That's why it's so important that every communication, every meeting, we're preparing for those meetings. We're thinking about what we want to talk about. We're intentional about how we're showing up because every word I say, every nonverbal cue is, is either going to help me build trust or it's going to erode trust. And it couldn't be more important to actually seeing growth and development. Right. Yeah. I love the way you framed trust. It's that really someone that is your go-to person that will listen. You can tell anything to that will give you direct and sage advice in, in kind of that loop of, you know, and that in the middle of that is, is trust. That's, uh, and I love that frame of reference, your, your friend that you'd be able to call and how do you, how do you gain that with that mentor mentee relationship by preparing and understanding. And that's amazing. Yeah, absolutely. So important. Yeah. Yeah. And this could go a multitude of ways. You, you've dropped incredible wisdom on us today, but I'd love to ask you, you know, three pieces of advice, and it could be at the mentoring program level. It could be three pieces of advice for the relationship, you know, of a mentor mentee, or it could be for one or the other, but I'd love you to take it in any direction, you know, that, that you'd like. So again, what are the three piece of, pieces of advice around those different areas or holistically? <laughs> I think that the first piece of advice I would share and or repeat that is true for all of that is to make sure you're taking care of yourself first. Mm. You can't be good to anyone else if you are, if you implode. <laughs> and I mentioned Charlie Gilkey uh, earlier. He was one of the first people to help me understand what that means. And that means, for example, in my case, not feeling guilt if I have a babysitter sometimes, not feeling guilt if I have someone dropping off my groceries, right? These are things that I might need to make space for taking care of myself. And that helps me manage my work better, maybe mentoring programs better. It helps me be a better mentor, a better learning partner, all of the above. So I think that's important. Just a better human, which we're all trying to do. <laughs> and I think that the second piece of advice I'll, I'll say this is really important for mentors, which is people don't care what you know until they know that you care. Mm -hmm. So I'm a very direct person 
And I like to get down to business and get things talked about and get answers. And I remember I was probably 25 when I, someone first told me that. And it is still one of the most impactful things anyone's ever said to me. It's so true. You can be the smartest person in the room, but no one really cares if you're a jerk, right? So, um, so making sure if you're mentoring others that you're asking questions, that you're making connections on a human level before you start handing out advice, because that advice is only going to be worth as much as you've invested in that relationship so far. And my third piece of advice I'd have to say is for anyone who is involved in mentoring programs, managing mentoring programs, thinking of starting a mentoring program, I think it's about looking for the story. I think we started the conversation somewhat about looking for your why or understanding your purpose for the program. And I would even say it's it's so important to look for the story of that purpose. What is the story we want to tell one, two, and three years after this program has been running? What is the story of success that we are looking to see? Because when we visualize that, when we imagine what data is going to come out of this, when we imagine the impact on our employees, on our team, or whoever's involved, we create a collective vision that everyone can follow, even if there isn't a script to follow. Everyone is making decisions and able to be innovative and able to be autonomous towards that shared vision. And and that's because we are built to learn and and to connect on story. So I think that's super important. Great pieces of advice. You know, part of it is yourself first or self-care and making sure you can take time for that, you know, mentally, physically, spiritually, to make sure you're, you're showing up as your best self. And that's great advice for a mentor, mentee, everyone, humans in general. And then having that deep caring and empathy first before the advice comes, make sure you know uh, the person, what their struggles are and, and really truly understanding how you can help before you bring out all of your great experiences and advice. And then lastly, I think, you know, looking for the story, but I think you, you nailed the foundation of the story, which is make the ment- mentee the hero. Mm-hmm. And if you start there, then you can actually build your, your why. But if that's your outcome that you're looking for, that's, that's a beautiful place to start. So Jen, I'm, I'm super inspired. You gave us so much, you know, wisdom today from, you know, constructs of how to think about mentoring, the different ways to, to think about the lenses of mentoring, and then your three pieces of advice that help drive our, our audience to really think differently. So thank you so much for being with us today. Absolutely. It's my pleasure. Thank you.